Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focus Compounding, sitting next to Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. Hope it's going great for everybody else. For this first time you're tuning in, make sure you hit that subscribe button both on YouTube and the podcast side of things. I'm going to shorten up the intro today because we have 25 minutes that we're going to go through and answer as many questions as we possibly can. Uh, To be on the lookout for that in the future, follow me at Focus Compound on Twitter. So for the first question, says, on the last podcast, Chef said it hasn't worked out for him to buy stocks with higher share turnover. I get that low share turnover could lead to mispricings. Are there any other reasons why that is good? Um, so I, I'm not exactly sure, but it, it's a measure of liquidity. And there tends to be a pattern where for a few years, sometimes that long, uh, the company tends to get less and less liquid and then more and more liquid. Um, so I guess it it can be a measure of how discovered a stock is, I guess you could say. Um, it's hard to know exactly why. Uh, in my experience, it's it's been true. So I don't... Um, low share turnover, so um, a low percentage of the total shares outstanding trading does always seem to be associated when I look at it with stocks I consider overlooked, misunderstood, etc. There's no reason why that would have to be true. Sure, people could trade a stock really rapidly and not understand it. Um, but just in my experience that those two things have always been correlated. Next question. Have you got any thoughts on how value may eventually catch a bid? It seems as though many, or at least a large portion of the current money is going towards whatever ticker shouted loudest with what seems like literally zero thought given to fundamentals. Uh, no, I mean, I live through the late nineties. It, you know, something happens eventually. And then he says, I guess whether if, and when this is, to blow up the YOLO bidders will shift money to boring, but fundamentally strong businesses at low or reasonable valuations. Yeah. A lot of people just leave the market. I mean, individuals, uh, this is, I liked this question last okay. night. Uh, should I get a, it says, <laughs> so, so Jeff can wear or can't wear flannels all summer. Does that mean it's, it's sun's out guns out? Uh, Jeff can wear flannels all, all, um, summer. Uh, yeah. I said when we were walking in 90 plus degree weather, the other day I said you had your flannel your usual outfit on yeah you've made a big point that you've never seen me wear shorts I have not ever seen yeah. Jeff wear shorts uh, and then he says let's say before you left Jeff had a tolerance of Andrew of an eight out of ten <laughs> <laughs> which is what you said before right? yeah uh, what was it by the time you got done with the trip negative three uh, it was all right yeah, it was all right. We we said we uh, learned to work well together. We did. Yeah. The funniest part about, I guess, us um, working together on the road is we actually don't talk to each other when, when we're in the hotel room, I feel like. Uh, the hotel room. Hotel room. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't feel know like what that's all about. But we're yeah, in that's the hotel true. room because it's, it's at the end of the day. I don't know. I just like either sit there with my headphones on and do whatever yeah. and you do, whatever too. We're just, we don't even acknowledge each other. No, we don't really acknowledge each other in the hotel room. In the car and stuff, we talk all the time, but for whatever reason, yeah. I'm like, well, we've been talking all day. Okay. I've, I've got nothing else to say. Yeah. To you. Yeah, that's funny. And then he says, let's hear more about this meat diet. So I got to witness that firsthand. Okay. He, he, he stuck to the diet even on the trip. He ordered Chick fil A. Um, chicken nuggets at one point right and he asked for grilled nuggets Mm -hmm. and they gave him fried ones it didn't touch them and he didn't touch them and i was like you're i guess i have to eat them then so i had like 30 dollars of chick-fil-a to myself yeah and i made a mistake in a starbucks order i uh, forgot to indicate heavy cream or whatever instead of uh milk and same thing and you're like oh just drink it but no i don't i don't do it so um yeah so uh, how long you been on the meat diet um three and a half months and you like it? I feel better on it. Uh, I'm not sure that's healthy for you, but it works for me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I never. I feel much better. You know, not. I don't have headaches and things. So yeah, good stuff. Is Jeff a buyer of Tesla at today's price? I uh, know. Um, I thought that's funny. So <laughs> yeah. Tesla's been going pretty crazy lately. Um, let's see. If one targets an annual return of say 12 percent and wants to hold a stock for the long run, how do you decide if you should sell once the multiple has caught up? Would you sell a stock when the ROIC drops below 12% or do you look on the ROE, look at the ROE and the price to book at which you bought? Yeah, that's hard to say. Um, it's actually the return on incremental invested capital that matters. 
So it, it would be if the new money being put in seems to be at less than 12%, but it's really, really hard to measure that. Um, but yeah, that's what would happen. So actually, even if it is at 11% or I mean at 13% or higher or something, that doesn't necessarily matter if it started at 40%. So it's really whether it's rising or falling, it's easier to tell if it's rising. So if you mean, is it 13% return on equity or higher and it doesn't fall over time, then you can stick with it. Yeah. Um, if it's moving though, if it's dropping over time, then it's a harder math. Yeah. Um, next question, how much is too much to pay for a high return capital business? Munger says you will earn what the business earns over the long term, but Microsoft holders suffered from late nineties when the multiple shrank. Correct. Yeah. Um, we've talked about this a little bit. It really matters on the amount of growth. So it only is if you're growing a lot that does the return on capital, uh, matter that much. If you're a no growth business, it doesn't matter. Obviously Microsoft kept growing. Um, yeah, I don't know. Microsoft's a little complicated. It was already a very, very big company and it was really expensive. You got to be very, very careful with big companies that, um, have high multiples, but in general, the easiest way to do the math is just to assume a certain holding period. I tell people never to assume more than 15 years. It's just a random, uh, you know, arbitrary cutoff. But if you take a 15 year cutoff and you see that, for instance, something's going to drop from a P of 60 to 20, you know, you assume over those years, then you have to do the math on how much that will pull down your Kager. If Berkshire's purchase of gas assets from, uh, what is that, Dominion evidence that the energy sector is the best pond efficient for value in today's market? Uh, yeah, some energy things look really cheap to me. It's not an area I know that much about, but yeah. Um, some of it looks very cheap. Yeah. Hi, Jeff and Andrew. One of your checklist items is, does the stock chart work over time? However, it clearly doesn't work on Vertu Motors, Psychomedics and Parks America, mm -hmm. which you either hold or have given high initial interest ratings to. When is this filter useful? The filter is always useful. So if I use a long-term stock chart, the thing to figure out is why the chart is the way that it is. So what we're talking about here is like, if I look at something that's 30 years, let's say, or 25 years or 15 years, and then ask the question, why is it the way it is? Um, so some of the stocks you mentioned, we know exactly why it is. Um, so some things are, it started with a really high multiple and ended with a low multiple. That's easy. Um, I can forgive a stock for that. There's no problem. I'm p buying at the low multiple. So, for instance, if Microsoft stock chart didn't work for 15 years from 1999 to you know uh, 2014 or whatever, you know, picking random numbers, um, then that's mostly because it had too high PE, right? Um, in the other case, we have companies where something major has changed about the business. So like, for instance, Virtu Motors, they did two um, major share issuances, which had a major effect on it. And then the last five years, or it's close to that now, um, all UK car dealers have been cheap because of like Brexit and that sort of thing happening. Um, so it declined in the multiple. So like Virtu, you know, there's a decline in the multiple and they issued shares in the past. You would assume that if I own Virtu, then probably I don't expect them to issue shares in the future at low price to book. And I don't expect their multiples to contract further. The other ones, um, you could look into their long-term history. Uh, one of them had, was used to be a much more expensive stock. And um, I think for Psychomedics, it may also not be correctly measuring the dividend. Psychomedics paid a ton of dividends over time. So you might be looking at a stock chart that isn't counting the dividends right. I don't know if that's true, but be careful about that. They've paid an incredible amount of dividends versus most public companies. And then another one is the business has changed a lot. So the difference between the business and the stock is pretty dramatic. Next question. Jeff is not a big fan of REITs, but what's his opinion on the best way to value one? <laughs> That's part of the problem. Uh, the way to value a REIT would have to be very, very sensitive to interest rate stuff. So I just think that a REIT is to a very big extent a speculation on long-term interest rates. Next question. Thoughts on process versus outcome of an investment. This is something that actually we mm -hmm. talked a lot about, right? Example of buying Tesla at 500 turn out to have a good outcome, but your process to get there may not be reliable. Yeah. I would, um, I think that's a very, very hard thing to figure out. It can take years sometimes to know that's the problem. Um, and yet in some other cases, it doesn't take years to know. I think it depends on, I mean, we could give examples of things. So like there's some things where you're lucky and stuff like that. So, uh, we sold out of a stock, um, points international I mentioned, and some people say, oh, that's a good decision or whatever, but the actual timing isn't. So, um, you know, I can't count on having good timing. That's a luck. Uh, that's an issue of luck. Um, but you can count on buying something that's very uh, cheap and then it goes up 
um, after that. And so sometimes in, you can tell in a year with a net net. Um, but on the other hand, you can't with some other things. So I've made investments that have been only a year or so, and I would say were successful and, and whatever, um, that they were good decisions. But uh, it's... I don't know if it's that hard to say. I mean, I, I think I can do okay separating them out. Um, like, for instance, we talked about KEWL, the Timberland Company. I would say it's clear that I made a mistake on that one and not just that the stock dropped. Um, it's been a while, and it's consistently traded well below uh, prices at which we were willing to buy it. And uh, appraisals of other Timberland around the country that's comparable to it has come down to and deals and things to a level that means that that was too high a price to pay for it. So like that's a lot of evidence that my process was wrong on that one. On some other ones, it's really hard. Uh, it's very, very hard because I might be right about part of it, but other parts were somewhat luck things, you know, uh, can, if something happened because of COVID or whatever, is that a mistake or not? Well, if you bought a heavily indebted company, the reason it like is on the, or say a retailer that was already in terrible shape, it could be, is the bankruptcy because of COVID or not? It, it's both. It ha the, the proximate cause of it was, um, COVID, but you still might've made a mistake in that you're doing something that was risky, but you would have survived otherwise if it wasn't for COVID. Maybe those are the ones that are hard to judge. Mm -hmm. And he said, also thoughts on Berkshire buying natural gas transmission. Does it seem bullish for NACO long term? Uh, in the very, very long term, I would expect that the part of the country that NACO has some natural gas coming out of has the potential. I don't know if it'll happen to move very, to produce very, very large volumes as a percent of U.S. Um, energy stuff. Um, in the very long run. So it is possible that that area, uh, an area that we were in recently, um, and we're talking about like Utica and, and uh, stuff like that, um, would the Northeast kind of thing, right? So there's a lot of energy that could come from there eventually, but it depends on factors of the prices of that versus other things and it depends somewhat on credit conditions that we've talked about and all those sorts of things so how willing are people to um extract a lot of gas from there and that i think depends somewhat on credit conditions and on pricing and stuff like that but in the very very long run there's the potential to get a lot out of there and stuff so um i don't know if it's bullish because the price is what matters a lot to naco naco gets royalties on it so i don't know if it's bullish but volume i think is yeah i think there'll be a lot more volume um, how closely should investors follow their portfolio companies? Should they read every press release, AK, et cetera? I do. Uh, you can. Yeah. I don't I see do. the harm in doing that. I like doing that. Yeah. I can write to my email. Did Jim Mitchell of Mitchell Partners influence the over-the-counter market searching you two did, or did your OTC approach come from somewhere else? Yeah, it, it, there was no influence from that, no. But I know what you're talking about, yeah. Um... What are some ways to learn about an industry besides reading 10Ks, primers, analyst reports? How does Jeff go about this? How would you feel about a company with less than 20 to 30 percent market share but great financial performance? Uh, so, like, I I like reading 10Ks of all the companies in the industry. I like reading letters um, to shareholders, investor presentations, things like that. Um, I don't know if I found analyst reports that useful generally. I don't find stock write-ups very useful at all. Um, sometimes I have found trade magazine stuff, things online that are like that to be really useful. Uh, mostly you go search once you have like questions about it. I, I form a long list of questions and then I try to answer those specific questions that confuse me about a business or something like that. Um, well, what do you think about learning about industry? I like reading like blogs and stuff like that. Okay. I've done that. So reading other 10Ks, listening to what other analysts, or not analysts, but like earnings calls and stuff like that, you get a really good feel for it. But trying to find blogs. So for example, if you know you are invested in a, I don't know, an amusement park business, find mm -hmm. every amusement park industry uh, blog out there, but also like, uh, you know, books. I felt like yeah. the QSR, uh, websites for, you know, restaurants and stuff like that. Just read everything you possibly can on the industry. I think that's good. But books, I really like finding whenever we come across a new company, for example, we've talked about, fine, we've talked about Dover Motorsports on here. Yeah. Right? One thing we did was we ordered, I ordered, which still has not arrived a book <laughs> on just the start of NASCAR, just mm -hmm. to get more familiar with it. Because quite honestly, 
I speak for Jeff too. I mean, we don't know much about NASCAR, but just to really get more familiar with it. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Your method seems to mainly focus on bottom up valuation about a business. How and when do you use macro factors in your thesis? And then number two, does Jeff always wear <laughs> plaid long sleeves to corrupt the fact he has covered up or he's covered in gnarly tattoos? Just a hunch. So uh, people have asked that. Yeah, we were debating this on the trip. Um, the part that annoys me about if you ever did get tattoos is uh-huh. you would never like openly show. I would see it like right. three months later. I'd be like, wait, what? You got tattoos? <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's a possible advantage. I mean, in the business that we're in, I tell Andrew, I said, you know, look, I'm covered up all the time, so it's fine if I get tattoos. Um, yeah, I think Andrew's anti-tattoo as a thing, but we'll see. Um, <laughs> I say they look cool on other people. On other people, okay. Yes. Um, yeah, so uh, bottom evaluation macro factors. Uh, the macro factor thing is mostly checking in on not buying something at the wrong time. I would say that's overwhelmingly what it is. So um, there's a lot of stocks that look cheap or something, and someone um, suggests that to me, and I pass on it because I'm just concerned about the point in the in the cycle or whatever that we're in. We just talked about um, gas, for instance, or there could be something like Met Coal or something, right? Like now, I could look at some things in that, but a few years ago, when people said they look cheap on EBITDA or free cash flow or whatever, I would pass because I'm not going to look at businesses that are at the top of their cycle that way. The same thing, I, I'll just mostly just pass on things where I think um, uh, the credit cycle is dangerous or something in them. So I talked a little while ago, a few years ago, about how much I liked certain um, subprime auto companies and stuff, but I just stay away from them when I think they're making the riskiest loans they've ever made. And that was like, I don't know, three years ago or so. Um, so any of those sorts of things, if you know, like I mentioned that I'd been to Ireland and it looked like they had this weird housing boom. I don't try to figure out when I see something that weird, I don't try to figure out whether it's, ju- it's justified or not, whether it's priced into it. If there's a crazy housing boom in your country, I just won't buy your banks and stuff. That's the way that I think is safest. And, and so it's just a matter of like, are these peak earnings or are these bottom of the cycle? Maybe read, um, Howard Marks mastering the market cycle or something like that to get an idea of what it, it, it means. I, macro factors only matter to me when they're way out of whack one way or the other. And mostly the most important is to be really cautious when macro factors seem to be really favoring that investment. That's the one that I'm very cautious about. So a lot of times the company that looks really cheap to people on like a free cash flow basis is having one of its best years ever. So I'd be really, really careful. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have an opinion on Movado or the, any, any of the other companies? This next question, snap judgment on CWL, dot to oh, what's your opinion on movado the current share price any opinion on system of module market slash industry growth we can look at movado um i don't think i can do a snap judgment and call well because i have slight familiarity with the company um movado m-o-v the, uh, we are yeah. using quickfs.net mm-hmm. if you do sign up because you love this website tell them that you came from focus compounding mm-hmm. already so i mean movado looks cheap uh, this looks like a classic Ben Graham value stock. That's probably the easiest way to explain it. We've talked about Graham numbers before. That's one way to think about it. So a Graham number, you take the PE and you multiply it by the PB. Here, it's like three. Uh, that's incredibly low. Graham suggested avoiding all stocks over about 22. So um, this is incredibly cheap, and it would screen for that. I've screened before for stocks with a Graham number below five. It seems to work pretty interestingly. As long as the company is legitimate, you know that, stuff like that. So if you like the business, it's very, very cheap. Um, it is a watch business and I don't know that much about what they'll be like going forward. Uh, it has a very meaningful, although the name is Movado, it has a very meaningful licensed business. Um, so it's not all just the Movado brand or the ESQ brand or things like that. If you look at actually click the business description, it might tell us what does it tell us any of the things that they, yeah, there you go. Hugo boss, Tommy Hilfiger coach. Those are some of the brands that they have. Um, yeah, I mean, if you could do a basket or something, it, w- it would work out in the long run, I think. Um, but for what, yeah, I mean, this is just, yeah, it looks incredibly cheap. I don't know what else to say beyond that, but I, I it's probably not something that we would buy, but, um, what's your top idea? You have to put a hundred percent of your net worth into one idea. What is it? Your balance sheet, but with max leverage into one idea, which um, I, I don't know. 
uh, the answer to that. I mean, if it was meant to be like a forever thing or something, that'd be different than a shorter term thing. Um, okay. So let's say, I mean, for me personally, term. it would probably, it'd usually be a bank. I feel that I can find a small bank that I like the best that will have the highest returns for a long time. I can understand it pretty well and stuff. I wouldn't suggest that to other people, but there's always a bank in the country I can find and like a lot. And I'm comfortable with that. Yeah. They'll last a very, very long time. If you find the right bank, it'll be here in a hundred years. So, mm. Um, Jeff did an analysis of a home builder before it seems that home buying is holding up in a shelter in place world. How do you think the long-term value of home builders has changed in 2020? Uh, I, I don't know. Home builders are kind of tough. It, the thing that benefits home builders a ton. Yeah. The thing that's benefiting home builders a ton right now is low interest rates combined with low inflation. If you reverse those things or anything like that, you, you start to have real problems. Home builders produced like no, uh, economic value at all about 45, 50 years ago or so there was very high inflation. Um, and I just think that we've had a very long period where that hasn't happened, where uh, wage inflation hasn't been high and yet, um, interest rates have been very low. So I'd be cautious. Um, some of the homeowners we talk about are basically speculation on it's their land inventory, which is giving you the return over time. So it's just a way of like having a leverage speculation on land. Like we're talking about Greenberg partners or something that's, that's sort of like buying about. Dallas based land and Atlanta based land at like a 1.3 times, mm -hmm. uh, leverage. So, you know, if you want to do that, it, you know, you could buy a, instead of buying a house or something as your way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, you have to put a hundred percent of your net worth into one Berkshire subsidiary. Which one do you choose? hundred percent of my net worth into one Berkshire subsidiary. Hmm. That's pretty hard. Um, I would say, I would say Geico, except there is some issues with self-driving cars in the very long term. So if I could sell it, you know, it's not that I have to keep it forever. It would be Geico. Any thoughts on, but by the way, I progress might be even better than Geico, <laughs> but you know, any thoughts on CLCT now that Alta Fox is trying to get board seats. Seems like an old school Buffett situation collector's universe yeah i mean i read the letter and um yeah i followed the stock a little bit i i chose not to write it up um but i looked at it at the beginning of the year just because i was kind of interested in their business okay but other than that it didn't really go anywhere yeah so some things have changed already with the business over the last few years even before this uh there's a lot of change going on um I don't know. I had said to you, I th it'll be interesting. I, I mean, if it really comes down to a vote and stuff, it'll be tough because they have a meaningful amount of passive shareholders. So, um, you know, like institutional shareholders. Mm -hmm. Normally, it's hard for a company with a lot of institutional shareholders for you to get board seats and stuff. But for for like a, whatever it is, is it quite a micro cap right now or is it bigger than that? I mean, it's like what, a couple hundred million? For its size, its shares turn over more than you'd expect. Mm -hmm. Um. What actions do you look for to determine whether a CEO is an outsider? Uh, unusual uh, uses of debt, share insurance, and buybacks in a way that others don't normally do. So um, capital allocation, that's very unusual for the industry, I would say, is the one. Um, then you have to judge whether it's like smart or stupid what they ended up doing but just not following sort of the typical playbook that way for cap allocation. I think that's a big one. If a position grows in value to become a material part of your portfolio, how do you manage it? Um, normally we let it run for pretty much, uh, we let it run as much as possible. Eventually it could become a problem, but usually the thing we like enough to buy a lot of if it ran and stuff would be fairly safe. I don't know what I would do if it was, we don't have sort of those ones that were say, you know, the optionality kind of things. That's the ones where it becomes more of an issue. If we bought something that was incredibly cheap and it went up a lot and then we're like, Oh, this is more like not as predictable, then we'd have a problem. But if it's very predictable stock, I don't think it causes such a problem. But if you were an individual investor, when you're in a fund, it's a little bit different, but as an individual investor, you would take the coffee can approach, which we took the, we discussed yeah. on a, on a podcast. Me personally. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so that's essentially 
buying it and holding it forever. Right? Yeah. And only buying new stock with maybe new income or new capital that you invest as opposed to like trimming or any of that stuff. Right. But that's not how we run the managed accounts for people. Like yeah. we will eventually trim back something if that happens. So, I mean, we less than everyone else, less than most other professional investors would, but uh, we don't run the managed accounts exactly like I would um, run a coffee can portfolio or something. That's true. Yeah. But if you're an individual investor, maybe go watch yeah. that video if you want to get more on that. Um, do you leverage Porter's five forces when considering the, the defensibility of a moat? Yeah. I mean, I look at Porter's five forces. I think it's a really, really good description of how to understand those things. And I do talk about that somewhat because it's bargaining power with like suppliers and stuff is often as important as with customers. So I do look at that. Yeah. What non-business book taught you the most about investing? Hmm. Non-business book. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I do. I have mentioned before, there's a book, uh, the beast in the garden. I think it is about mountain lion attacks in Colorado. And I think it is very interesting to read from the perspective of how groups perceive risk how something is like risk-free that they're unimaginable to them being very scared of it and stuff like that. And animal attacks are an interesting one that way. I don't think anyone will read that book and get a lot out of it. But for me, it was fascinating in terms of what I call risk habituation. Uh, we could make this our last question. Okay. How do you go about measuring your return drag from stock dilution? Uh, generally I look at how much they diluted in the past. Um, there can be some exceptions when I think it's going to be different, but I do generally look at, um, like um we added to the calculation like what they've historically done yeah so if they if their shares go up on average by one and a half percent a year over the last 10 or 20 years then probably i'm going to use a number close to that mm -hmm. when figuring out how much they're going to drag down my performance in the future cool well that was 25 minutes of questions be on the lookout for this in the future we are going to do this once a week so be sure to follow me on twitter at focus compound to ask questions. I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with Jeff and I on the Focus Compounding Podcast. Make sure you hit the subscribe button both on YouTube and the podcast side of things. Uh, we did do a quick snap judgment on quickfs.net. So if you do decide to sign up uh, for that service, uh, Jeff and I use it every single day. Make sure you tell them you came from Focus Compounding. I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in and we will see you in the next podcast.